The Furin Saga continues, as this video will provide the epic conclusion of the story of conceptual games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn, introducing the region's Elite Four and Champion, as well as their powerful Pokemon teams and battle tactics. The Furin region's Elite Four are all unique as they not only specialize each in a Pokemon type, but a Forge Form weapon type as well, being classified as the Slasher type, the Defender type, the Wrecker type, and the Piercer type. Just like the Fearin Region's gym leaders, they will all wield a Forge Form weapon to combat the emerging threat of Team's Brain and Team Brawn, as they are all essentially Champion Odin's Royal Guard. So this will be your greatest challenge yet, but don't forget that you are now the leader of your respective team, Brain or Brawn, even wielding the Divine Pokémon you once worshipped. So the pressure is high as your team and the Divine Pokémon are counting on you to win in order to conquer the Fearin Region. While this video will cover the climax of the story, fear not, this isn't the end of the Fearin Saga or my Fearin videos, as I still have an epilogue video to post after this one, which will feature some familiar faces appearing in the Fearin region with brand new teams, as well as two brand new DLC videos with new locations, characters, and Pokemon on the way. So there's plenty more to still explore within the Fearin region. A fantastical place with a variety of diverse and breathtaking landscapes, each housing magical and mighty creatures known as Pokémon, wielded by fierce warriors known as Pokémon Trainers. Over the next several videos on my YouTube channel, I plan to take you on an epic adventure through my imagination, as I'll fully explore the sagas of the Fearin region just as they would unfold in its conceptual games Pokémon Brain and Pokémon Brawn, introducing all of the characters you'd encounter on your journey and their Pokémon teams, including some familiar faces from all over the Pokémon world. But first, you must select the starter Pokémon that will be accompanying you on your quest. You have the Grass Cub Berry, the Fire Pony Feloga, and the Bubble Crab Krabub. So which of these three will be your secret weapon in the Fearin region? I've been exploring the Fearin region in an ongoing series here on my YouTube channel and on my Instagram page at Mikemon underscore regions, commissioning a variety of talented artists to help bring all of my ideas and designs to life and take you on an exciting journey through my imagination in my own little corner of the Pokemon world inspired by Iceland and Norse mythology. So if you enjoyed this video, please make sure to hit that like button. And if you'd like to learn even more about the Fearin region, for those of you who are new, I highly recommend checking out some of my previous videos. I do, however, recommend watching this series from the beginning as the first video sets the stage with the main cast of characters, followed by a video introducing the members of both teams and all their battles, followed by my last video, which featured all of the gym leaders and their Pokemon teams. The last video also gave a glimpse of what the gameplay in these games would look like while wielding a Forge Form weapon, introducing new RPG style sections of battle called freestyle sections that are seamlessly sprinkled in to the traditional turn-based Pokemon battles, at least while wielding a Forge Form. These sections and how your opponents in this video battle within these sections will be brought up several times throughout this video, so I definitely at the very least recommend going back and watching that video if you haven't already, especially as the incredible animator at Yes Sir did a phenomenal job bringing all of my ideas to life in beautiful fashion. Thanks to him, I'm finally able to show you the Forge Form mechanic in action, just how I've always imagined it. And believe me, you've seen nothing yet. There is plenty more just like this to come, and I cannot wait to share it with you. So please make sure to go give him a follow to see even more of his beautiful 3D models and animations. I'd also like to give a shout out to my good friend Trainer Matt, the phenomenally talented artist I commissioned to draw all of these characters and Forge Form weapons. I always have so much fun working with him, we work great together. So please do yourself a favor and make sure to go check out his and all the other amazing artists I commissioned to bring my ideas to life's fake mon projects as well. The links to all of their pages can be found in the description below, so please go give them some love. Now the last video ended with you defeating the final gym leader Sigrun, as the gates to the Bifrost Bridge inspired Victory Road are found in her city, which leads to an Asgard inspired Fearin League. But as I mentioned in the last video, there are quite a bit of main story beats and battles before your final gym battle, which I didn't want to talk about in the last video as it was focused on the gym leaders and it was already pretty bloated. So as promised, I want to rewind a little bit and go back to those moments, as this video will provide the climax to the story. Starting with an emotional battle with your mother, Professor Aspen. After finally finding out about your involvement 
with your respective team in the Boral Bay. She ends up getting weird readings detecting a strange energy source from the Aurora Hedge, so she's going to investigate as she suspects Team Brain or Team Brawn to be behind it as it's got the signature of a divine Pokemon. However, bumping into you on the way to the same event where your team leader Thor or Loki is waiting for you, she ends up finally discovering that you are part of this team which obviously doesn't go well, but I'll get into that here shortly. This is the final team she uses, being a compilation of the single stage Pokemon she has used in various other battles against her in the region, in addition to her starter Pokemon, of course, being the one weaker to yours. This would be her first time actually wielding a Forge Form in one of your battles against her, being the fully evolved starter Pokemon she chose to adopt. And she's only using this weapon to give you some tough love, as she's not happy with this discovery especially despite her best efforts to warn you of this feud and ask you not to get involved. So she is ready to show you firsthand how serious Forge Form battles can be. And she'd even have an upper hand in the freestyle sections of this battle, as she'd be able to use her Rotom Wheelchair's helicopter function to hover around the water and go iceberg to iceberg with ease. You can go after her surfing on Ferenian Lapras, but she's much faster and usually goes for the highest point of the peak, charging up a long distance attack to strike you with. To reflect the icy location and her ace Pokemon Shakuru, who is an ice type, you'd also have ice type mini bosses to contend with in the form of Bearctic or Avalug while on the icebergs and Walrein or Gyarados while surfing between the iceberg islands. After defeating her, she realizes just how capable you and your Pokemon really are, and finally reveals to you the incident that led to her becoming paralyzed. She was having a Forge Form battle against her dear friend Isaac, most of you know is blind, so he wasn't able to help her avoid what was to come. So in the heat of their Forge Form battle, she wasn't paying attention to her surroundings and ended up slipping and falling off a snowy cliff. Even her Pokemon's aura armor wasn't able to protect her as it normally would because she dropped her weapon before the fall. This is why she has always been overprotective and didn't want you to have a Pokemon for so long. It also explains why she was so worried about you getting involved with these teams turf war and participating in Forge Form battles. She was only ever trying to protect you from getting hurt like she did. She is sobbing during this family moment between the two of you and it ends with a big hug. She says she couldn't be more proud of you and your Pokemon and that you are more than capable of going all the way. She encourages you to chase your dream and go after the Fearn League. But first, you both go to the Aurora Hedge to see exactly what's going on, as the divine Pokemon you worship is starting to execute part of their plan. However, your mother tells you from the information she's gathering that this isn't good, and begs you to stop them. So you would do exactly that, battling your own team leader, who is disappointed by your disobedience. If you picked Pokemon Brain, you'll be battling Loki, who will use a team of special attackers, primarily made up of resourceful psychic types. While if you picked Pokemon Brawn, you'll be facing Thor, who will use a team of physical attackers, primarily being powerful fighting types. Thor's team is more offensive, hitting hard and fast, with Pokemon that cannot just deliver a hit, but take one as well. While Loki's team implements oppressive strategies, making the most of status moves and effects to control the battle. Of course, both will have the divine Pokemon they serve, wielding its fierce forge form at the end of the battle. For the freestyle sections of this battle, they'd use some signature attacks as well, like a typical boss battle. Loki using magical attacks that keep you on your toes as he makes the most of his piercer-type weapons, close and wide-range attacks to corner you, and Thor using powerful lightning-based attacks that devastate the battlefield as he overpowers you with his strong record-type attacks. The mini-bosses against Loki would be Alakazam and Gothitel, while the mini-bosses against Thor would be Machamp and Conkeldur, called upon by the power of the divine Pokémon they wield, as they can't naturally be found in this area. Because of this, these mini-boss Pokémon won't attack your opponent like they normally do in the freestyle sections, so you're going to have a lot on your plate in this battle. However, if you manage to win, you'll be able to catch the mascot legendary and divine Pokémon of your version for yourself, just as you do any Forge Form capable Pokémon at the end of a raid battle after defeating a raider. So this is essentially the mascot legendary battle of the game. And the reason that you're able to catch this divine Pokemon after the battle is because it chooses you after defeating the team leader as it now sees you as more fit to lead this team and wield its power. However, you'll quickly see afterwards that this great power comes with great responsibility and that the team leader wasn't actually the one calling the shots, as the divine Pokemon will appear for various cutscenes for the remainder of the story trying to manipulate you into doing what it says as it did the previous leader. After this legendary battle, you'd go to the Ice Cave, which was currently blocked off. Here you'll encounter your childhood best friend turned rival for yet another battle, this time using 
their fully evolved starter Pokemon super effective against yours and its Forge Form weapon. They are once again jealous of your success, as they know you are now the team's leader and have caught the team's chosen divine Pokemon. However, this has encouraged them to do the same, but before doing so, they want to see if they can defeat you. Here is the team they'd be using in this battle. In the freestyle section of this battle, the mini bosses would be Ice Types, Snowwark, and Chillinx, as they kind of represent both Team Brain and Team Brawn, being version exclusives and special and physical attackers. The Ice Cave is a labyrinth full of various tunnels and levels, so during the freestyle sections of this battle, your rival will actually run around making use of this frozen funhouse, hiding around the corners waiting to strike when you least expect it. So if you want to charge up your Forge Force gauge in the freestyle sections of this battle, then you're going to have to chase them around the Ice Cavern and avoid the mini-boss Pokemon altogether, otherwise you'll never catch up with your rival. This battle is unique, as this is your first battle since joining each team, without members of both your teams watching you, so your rival will actually apologize to you for how out of hand things have gotten, and you two will actually be able to have a fun spirited battle just for the fun of it without any pressure, reminding each other that you are still friends. You'd even both receive your frozen fossils here, and they'd let you pick first as an act of good faith. While you agree neither of you can hold back from here on out, as you both are determined to become champion and see your team's goals through, and only one of you can succeed in doing so, it is nice knowing that your friendship, while strained, is still intact. Okay, now let's go back to where we left off right before Victory Road. Now there are no wild Pokemon on this Victory Road, but there are several trainers for you to battle and hone your skills, and at the end of the line you'll be greeted by an old friend, Ragnar, who challenges you to one last battle as their true self as they once dreaded battling unless in the Fantasia persona, but thanks to you, they now have the courage to do so without it. Not to say they have given up that persona entirely, it's just no longer the crutch it used to be, as they have gained a new sense of confidence after standing up to their big brothers and revealing their secret identity. So here is Ragnar's updated team of Dragon-type Pokémon. It is also important to note that outside of the gym battle with Fangtasia, you've never actually had a Forge Form battle against Ragnar, and Ragnar will be wielding a new ace weapon in the form of pseudo-legendary Yotundra's Ice Club, inspired by Frost Giant Ymir's signature weapon. As far as the freestyle section of this battle goes, wielding a Wrecker-type weapon, Ragnar can now deal some serious damage with their attacks even through your blocks, but they're also fairly slow given the Ice Club's weight and size, so use this to your advantage, but be careful to avoid the mini-boss Pokémon, which are once again Dragonite and Gudra, same as in their gym battle, as Fantasia. Ragnar wishes you the best of luck after your battle, and says they know you'll come out on top, as you actually look half-decent today, which is a running joke between the two of you, as those of you who follow these videos know, because Ragnar is constantly making fun of how you look or dress. So this is actually a big compliment coming from Ragnar. After this battle, you'll arrive in the magical and awe-inspiring Golden City inspired by the City of Asgard from Norse mythology, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with from the Thor movies. Ragnar will show you around as you'll be approached by all the members of your respective team, which you are now the leader of once again. So they're here to cheer you on in the final battles of the Fearn League and awaiting your orders as the Divine Pokemon's plan to conquer is quickly approaching. Ragnar is a little uncomfortable with this as they view these teams to be cult-like, well, because they are, but especially as both their big brothers were torn apart by these teams. So Ragnar is super confused as you start giving orders to the Grunts, as the divine Pokémon you have since captured is possessing you. Ragnar instantly knows something is up, as this is out of character for you, and Uncomfortable checks out, but tells you to be careful, that Champion Odin is willing to do whatever it takes to stop you and your group from climbing any higher. Now after entering the castle where the Fear and League is located, you'll find yourself in a giant hallway with several giant doors, each leading to one of the Elite Four members' giant chamber rooms themed after that member's respective typing. After defeating each Elite Four member, they will gift you a key. All four keys connect to make one large key that is needed to open the ginormous door at the center of the Grand Hall, which leads to Champion Odin's chamber with a large throne at the end of it. As I said, these Elite Four members can be faced in any order, but I'm going to start with Burner. You already had a brief encounter and battle with Burner in the Loford Farmlands before facing his father, Grass-type Gym Leader Berker, in the neighboring town. But he's gotten a lot stronger since, with an updated team of Mighty Ground-type Pokémon. Burner's design is quite simplistic, 
based on classic Icelandic clothing such as a tunic. He also has worker boots and belts fitting of a farmer such as himself sporting earthy colors like his father to represent his mastery of the ground typing. And I also really wanted him to resemble his father, which is why they share the same dark green hair. I mean that and the fact that they are related. But I wanted him to look like a spitting image of his father, almost like what a young Burker would have looked like at his age. Burner grew up on the Loford farmland, taught discipline and hard work by his father Burker, traits he will forever be grateful for as he's applied them to Pokemon battling. However, Burker always wanted his son to carry on the family tradition, taking over his Pokemon gym and the Loford farmlands. But Burner wanted more for himself, and didn't want to do what was always expected of him. Instead, he wanted to succeed his father, and do what no one else in his family has done, and become a member of the Elite Four. So using the valuable skills his father passed on to him, he worked his butt off in order to make that happen. While well, disappointed Burner wasn't going to carry on the family tradition, Burker has always been supportive of his son's goals and extremely proud of him. Burner still, of course, goes back and helps out on the farm every chance he gets. Now, thanks to his training and powerful ground type Pokemon, Burner is a force to be reckoned with. As far as his team goes, I picked ground types I felt were bulky and intimidating, as his team is mostly defensive to reflect the fact that he wields a shield and represents the defender weapon type. Naturally, he also has some native ground types to the Firin region, like Dargrave, and his father's ace Yggdras Soil, which I like to imagine his father lent to him for this battle, after losing to you in his gym, so his son would be fully prepared for what's to come. But he also had a Midgarden previously on his team, so it could have just as easily been his own Midgarden to evolve. He will of course be using his own ace once again, Odlom, based on cattle and the Primordial Cow from Norse mythology. Odlom also doubles as his forge form weapon, being a massive shield. Being a defender type, he can take all of your attacks head on without taking any damage in the freestyle sections of the battle. So your only chance to attack him is from behind. But good luck as he is often charging at you, utilizing the sharp horns on his shield. These charge attacks actually do a large chunk of damage too, and can be hard to dodge at times, but once you get the hang of it and learn how to time his attacks, you should be fine. Unlike the gym leader battles, since these battles take place indoors, there are no wild mini bosses to enter the fight, or help build up your forge form gauge for that matter. So inflicting damage to him in the freestyle sections is crucial if you want to fill your forge force gauge up enough to use your finisher move. And being he wields a shield, this can be quite difficult. There will be a brief period after his charge attacks where he will be vulnerable, so make sure to get behind him and make your move, as this brief window will be your only chance to really strike and help fill that gauge. And once again, since there are no mini bosses in these battles, these freestyle sections are a lot more like boss battles, as it's just you and your opponent, so they will each have a couple of extra attacks, much like the bosses in Legends Arceus, that you'll have to contend with in the freestyle sections instead. For example, Burner has his charging attack, which I previously mentioned, he also has an attack where he holds his shield up and causes a series of earthquakes all around the battlefield. The floor below will light up before the ground crumbles, so you have a brief period to evade, but if hit by these fissures, you'll take a significant amount of damage. And there are about five different quakes each time he uses this move. Since he is protected from all your head-on attacks wielding an offender type, I recommend using a wrecker type for this battle, as they not only deal more damage in freestyle battles, compared to other weapon types, but they can even deal some damage through blocks, meaning even his shield can't fully protect him from your attacks. Burner has been itching for a chance to rematch you after your last battle, and after losing to you, he has nothing but the utmost respect for you and your Pokemon, saying he can see how hard you and your Pokemon have worked to get here, and he hopes that all that hard work pays off for you. Next, I'm going to go over to Irma who a lot of you are already familiar with as I've introduced her in my fan favorite poison type focus video and in the second chapter as she faced off against you and both rival teams at the Pokecorp oil rig. Both her and her team of toxic poison types will be a lot stronger this time around though. Irma is a famous activist and environmentalist as well as the youngest member of the Firenze Elite Four. She uses potent poison type Pokemon as a bold political statement to show just how dangerous toxic chemicals can be by demolishing her opponent's immune system. Although she has a lot to say, she also isn't scared to actually get her hands dirty using her Garbotion's Forge Form weapon. She is respected for her filter-free statement and elevated fashion, in which she uses to get people to start genuine conversations about pollution. While Irma herself is a force of nature, she just wants to leave behind a better world for Pokemon and people alike to live in for generations to come. Needless to say, she is ready to take out the trash. 
Her character's role and personality was loosely inspired by young activist Greta Thunberg, who is an Icelandic but is Scandinavian as she's from Sweden, while her more punk rock appearance is inspired by prop princesses such as Avril Lavigne or Billie Eilish, but also takes some slight inspiration from the queen of crime Harley Quinn, especially in how she wields her hammer with absolute confidence. But make no mistake, while taking inspiration from all these strong females, Irma is still her own person and powerhouse Pokemon trainer. Like I said, her outfit is meant to make quite a political statement as several references to the environment, pollution, recycling can be seen. She has recycling earrings, she has save the environment spray painted on her boots, she's got a trash bag dress, so she's definitely quite bold. As for Irma's Pokemon team, given her role as an activist and humanitarian, I really wanted her to use poison types that made a statement and commented on pollution such as Rev of Room, Gold, and of course her Ace Garbotion. But of course she also has plenty of the region's native poison types and Pokemon that fit her edgy punk personality. And being a poison type user, of course she makes the most of the poison status in her battle, so be careful. Her Ace Pokemon Garbotion's Forge Form weapon is a hammer, so like most record types, it will do a good deal of damage in the freestyle sections. But whereas most wreckers are usually slow in the freestyle portions, Irma is surprisingly fast so you will really have to be on your guard. Once again, at least you won't have any mini bosses to contend with in this battle, but like Burner, she has her own signature freestyle attacks you will have to look out for. One where she makes a ball of sludge and bats it at you with her hammer, she will do so in quick succession, so you'll either have to evade or block. But if you manage to time your block, you can actually hit it back at her. Her second signature attack, you really have to watch out for as she jumps into the air and slams down with her hammer, creating a giant sludge wave. So even if you manage to dodge her initial strike, dodging the following sludge waves that follow can be difficult, especially as they cover a large portion of the battlefield. This attack can also poison you, which would carry over into the turn-based style sections, and is just as brutal in freestyle, if not more, paired with her powerful record-type attacks. A defender weapon would do you no good against her in this battle, as record types still deal some damage through blocks, nor would a record type of your own, as once again she is surprisingly fast for someone wielding a record type weapon. So therefore she would be faster than you and you don't want that. But either a slasher or piercer type weapon would do you perfectly fine in this battle. After defeating her she begs of you to always keep the safety of the environment in mind as it is home not only to humans but Pokemon as well and we are ruining it for them. She has you make a promise, which is sealed with a surprisingly powerful fist bump. I mean, girls gotta be quite strong to lift a hammer like that. Okay, those of you familiar with my first fake mon region, the Luika region on Instagram, already know and love Wife's Winter and Winda. Both used to share a Pokemon gym in the Luika region on top of a giant snowy mountain inspired by Mount Kilimanjaro in East Africa. Ice-type specialist Winter being exclusive to Pokemon Order, and Flying-type specialist Winda being exclusive to Pokemon Chaos. Sharing the responsibilities of the gym so they could both pursue their dreams of fashion on the side. Winter interested in fashion designing, as she was inspired to make her own clothing line, and Winda in modeling, as she'd be the face of Winter's clothing line. Well, it just so happens their dreams came true, as Winter's warm winter-themed fashion line was picked up in the frigid Fearn region, where winters are harsher and last a lot longer than most regions. So both packed their bags and moved to the Fearn region for a fresh start, and they even both got an upgrade as a member of the Elite Four. Now just like in Order and Chaos, they share the position, so both of them have time to keep up with their fashion line on the side. So it's technically an Elite Five in that sense, but there's still only four Elite Four members at a time as they do rotate. This time around, Ice-type Specialist Winter would be exclusive to Pokemon Brain, and Flying-type Specialist Window would be exclusive to Pokemon Brawn. I updated their outfits for the Fearin region with even cooler colors as they are launching a new winter fashion line, so I wanted that to be represented in their new clothing as it's tailor-fitted more for the Fearin region, and around the color scheme of their shared ace, Jirfal Cold. Now like the rest of the Fearin Elite 4 members, you'd have a chance earlier in the story to battle both Winter and Winda in a double battle. However, this battle wouldn't be part of the story like the other three, and instead is like a secret boss, as you can find them both in the tavern in the neighboring Viking village near your hometown of Apruna. You'd find them sitting at one of the tables where they'd share the story of their move with you, and ask if you'd like to have a Pokemon battle. If so, you'd meet them outside in the snow, and you'd get to battle them both in a double battle, both wielding the same Forge Form weapon 
Jir Falcold's bow, which shoots magical ice arrows. So given this is a double battle, to even the playing field, you'd be able to dual wield forge form weapons, and I definitely recommend doing so. As in the freestyle sections of this battle, they'd gang up on you, and wielding a piercer type weapon means they can attack with both close ranged and far ranged attacks. Winter normally sticks to close ranged attacks in this fight, using the sharp winged edges of her bow to strike, and Window would use the wide ranged attacks, shooting a bunch of magical ice arrows at you. But mid battle, after taking out half of their health, they would switch up their tactics just to throw you off. And here's a look at the Pokemon they would use in this double battle. Of course, their Pokemon teams are a lot bigger and stronger in their official Elite Four battle. Winter's Ice-type team is made up of powerhouse Pokemon with a real Arctic Edge, while Windus' team is made up of bold and beautiful Flying-type Pokemon, each sharing the same ace Pokemon once again, Girafal Cold, as it is both an Ice and Flying-type Pokemon. Now, once again, when battling the Elite Four, you'd only face one of them depending on the version you selected, so this isn't a double battle like your first encounter. And because of that, the freestyle sections will actually be a little easier in that sense, as you now only have one of them to contend with, but both would use the same battle tactics they used in the previous double battle, except now they would each have new signature moves to use in the freestyle battle. Close range attacks using the blade of their bows, and piercer type weapons long range attacks in the form of magical ice arrows. Now their signature moves in the freestyle are different each tailored to their own Pokemon type. Winter will have ice based attacks, for example, one of her attacks, she will shoot an ice arrow into the sky that splinters into several ice arrows that hail down from the sky and must be dodged. She also has an attack where she spins the bow making a blizzard around her. This attack has a chance of inflicting the frostbite status, which would carry into the traditional turn-based sections. This move also covers a lot of area and does quite a bit of damage. Winda being a flying type specialist uses more wind-based attacks. She will shoot an ice arrow into the sky like Winter did, but instead of causing hailstorm, it creates a windstorm with powerful gusts of wind flowing around the battlefield that you must dodge. She also has an attack where, like Winter, she spins her bow, but instead creates a giant tornado that covers the same amount of the arena. But instead of inflicting the frostbite status, this attack can pull you into it, and if you're pulled far enough in, it will inflict some serious damage. I'd actually recommend using your own piercer type weapon in this battle in order to maintain your distance and be able to strike them with long distance attacks, which is possible even when dodging their own long distance attacks are signature moves that dance across the battlefield, essentially killing two birds with one stone. Okay, last but not least, you have your battle against your mentor, Isaac. As most of you know, he was tasked by your concerned mother, Professor Aspen, early on in your journey to help you train in how to properly wield a forge form weapon, so you'd be safe, as she didn't want anything happening to you, like it did her, which resulted in her being in the wheelchair. He's not only an expert Pokemon trainer, but a skilled swordsman, despite being blinded since birth. His cunning Dark-type Pokemon have always acted as his eyes, guiding him through the darkness, helping him to hone his senses. Yes, he is inspired loosely by both Stick and Splinter from Daredevil and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, respectively, as they're both not only blind like Isaac, but share the same role as a strict mentor. Once again, inspired loosely, he still has his own personality and role within the story, the biggest difference between Isaac and his two inspirations are, is while he may be strict, he's also a lot more vulnerable. He really seems to have taken a liking to you, which makes the revelation that you've joined your respective team and he must take you down for the good of the region that much harder, because he must push all his personal feelings aside and not hold back at all against you. And trust me, this will be one of the toughest battles in the game, especially in the freestyle sections wielding his forge form, so you may wish he was holding back against you. He not only trained you in how to wield a forge form in battle in a tutorial introducing you to the mechanic, but he gifted you your battle bracer, which allows you to use the forge form mechanic, and gave you the Way of the Warrior super training tutorial as well, which not only allows you to super train all your Pokemon, but it's what allows forge form capable Pokemon able to transform into their forge form weapons after completing this training. You also had a little Pokemon battle against him as well in this tutorial, which ended up transitioning into the forge form tutorial as he lent you a Snow Warg or Chillinx's sword depending on your version. While training you how to wield a forge form, his partner Pokemon, Eyes and Ears Dark Type Rasquerade Sword, was his weapon of choice. But now, when actually facing him at the end of your journey as a member of the Elite Four, he will be using his secret weapon and true ace, Fire Dark Type Pseudo Magnarok. 
inspired by the fire giant of destruction, Surtur, from Norse mythology, as he will unleash a fury of destructive, fiery attacks using its flaming sword, inspired by Surtur's signature weapon. So prepare for a heated battle between teacher and student, as things between the two of you didn't end on the best terms since your last encounter, when he discovered you were in fact a member of Team Brain or Brawn. But the fact that you are now the leader of said team, and leading the charge to overthrow Champion Odin, there is a lot more at stake, and once again, he cannot afford to lose. As for the freestyle sections of this battle, like I said, this part especially will be one of the hardest yet, as he's not only extremely fast, easily your fastest opponent yet, but his fiery sword attacks are swift and relentless, as slasher types are known to have more combos than most weapon types. Being a dark type specialist as one of his signature moves in the freestyle section, he also often disappears into the shadows, emerging when you least expect it to strike. His other signature attacks are just as difficult to evade though, one fully utilizing this use of shadows as he constantly teleports around the battlefield between the shadows doing a variety of shadow based slashes. These attacks like I said are relentless and extremely difficult to dodge so you need to stay vigilant and block, just block block block, more importantly time your block perfectly to disrupt this attack as doing so is your only real chance of attacking him and doing damage in the freestyle section. His other signature attack has the magma on the blade of his sword extend out making the blade triple in length as it's then engulfed in flames and he starts slashing like a madman. Think Sephiroth from Kingdom Hearts because these sword slashes have a long coverage making it even harder to evade and they also do a serious amount of damage. And as if that wasn't bad enough, they even have a chance of inflicting you with the burn status that, like all the other status conditions in the freestyle sections, would carry over into the traditional turn-based sections of the Pokemon battle. So I highly recommend using an Offender-type weapon for this battle, so a lot of your damage is automatically nullified without you having to block. However, with him jumping around through the shadows so much, this will only protect you from the head-on attacks, as he does do quite a bit of attacks from behind or even the side. So this won't completely protect you, but as long as you stay vigilant with the defender type weapon, you can neutralize a lot of his damage. Whatever you do, I do not recommend using a record type weapon against him, because they are so slow and he's just too fast. Same with piercer types, long distance attacks while normally quite handy, would do no good with how fast he moves, and the close range attacks on piercer types don't have as many combos as slasher type weapons. So that being said, I actually believe slasher type weapons can be quite handy in this battle, especially if you perfectly time your blocks and are able to disrupt his attacks and get your own series of attacks in utilizing slasher types combos. He also has one more signature attack where he essentially summons Ragnarok as he lifts his sword into the air and calls a tempest of molten fireballs that rain down from the sky in quick succession. These fireballs cover quite a bit of the area and once again do an insane amount of damage. Enough that being hit by two of them would pretty much instantly make you faint. So this move is quite terrifying. But he is wide open during the duration of this attack. So if you can manage to get close enough to strike him without being hit by a fireball, you can actually get some good damage in and disrupt this attack, which you'll want to do as soon as possible. As for his Pokemon team and the more traditional turn-based styles of this Pokemon battle, Isaac's team of Dark-type Pokemon are extremely menacing. At least that's the vibe I was going for, as I really wanted them to have an air of mystery and mystique to them to match Isaac's personality, and once again, Magnarok is now his ace Pokemon. I'm actually totally in love with this team, it's my personal favorite of the Elite Four teams, but I would love to hear what your favorite of these Elite Four teams are, so please let me know down below in the comments which of these members is your favorite, and also which of these members' teams is your favorite. And it's also important to note you would be able to rematch the Elite Four in the post game with a full team of six and a slight level increase. Their signature freestyle attacks would also be turned up a little bit, so they last longer and do a little bit more damage. So expect more of a challenge in the post game. Now after beating the Elite Four and acquiring all four keys needed to unlock the giant doorway to champion Odin's throne room, the battle you've been waiting for can truly begin. Now while his name has popped up quite a bit throughout your journey and my videos for that matter, this is your first time actually meeting him. Although he seems to know everything about you, not only after all the commotion you and your team have caused in the region, but because the divine Pokemon he serves at Loden is omniscient and has had its eye on you for a while now. This is when you find out that a Loden has foreseen you 
to be the chosen one to stop the divine Pokemon despite currently serving one. So this comes as a shock. It has also followed you on your journey closely and is convinced that you'd be the perfect person to wield it next now that Champion Odin is growing weaker with age by the day. The only reason the other two divine Pokemon decided to form these teams and strike when they did in the first place. So this battle is not only Odin trying to stop you from going through with your divine Pokemon's plans of domination, but also Edlodin giving you one final test to see if you're worthy of one day wielding its powers. That being said, you won't actually be able to catch it till the second DLC, The King's Bounty, which it headlines as both Edlodin and Odin play a major role in that story as they will be fleshed out even more since they didn't really appear till the end of this story. Also, despite me mentioning how Odin is no longer in his prime, he will still provide you with one of the most challenging battles in the game, if not the most challenging, as he is still a top-notch warrior and Pokemon trainer. His team of ghoulish ghost-type Pokemon has to be my absolute favorite in the region, if I'm being honest. I know a lot of you really love all the ghost types in this region. I do as well, which is exactly why I decided to make him a ghost-type specialist in the first place. And what I love about this team is it not only fits Odin's role in Norse mythology, with some of its Pokemon referencing iconic characters, but they're all just so cool and powerful. His ace, of course, being the divine Pokemon and father of the Forge Form mechanic, Edlodin, who he also wields in this battle as his secret weapon, a magical spear modeled after Odin's signature spear from Norse mythology. Not to mention, with Spiritomb's new evolution Phantom being immune to fairy types and a literal legendary on his team, he will be quite the adversary. It's also important to note that like Edlodin, Phantom won't actually be available until the second DLC, so it's a nice tease of what's to come. Like the rest of the Elite Four members, the freestyle sections of his battle will be particularly hard, as Odin will use the wings on his spear to soar around the battlefield, making it hard to land an attack on him. He will also have his own powerful signature attacks in the freestyle sections you'll have to contend with, one of which being executed from high above as he showers several sharp shadowy feathers down at you in quick succession. My god, was that a tongue twister? Another one of his attacks also takes place from the sky, as he's covered in shadows, continuously swooping down and back up into the sky to strike you with his spear. This attack really leaves a mark and is even harder to evade, so I recommend, as usual, timing your blocks so you can disrupt it and get an attack in. This is one of your only chances to ground him in this fight. But while grounded, he uses standard close combat or long range distance attacks, throwing his spear at you before eventually taking back to the sky. However, his most dangerous attack is a one-hit KO move. The wings on his spear enlarge extra long like giant shadows, as each of them makes a giant swipe across the battlefield, each doing enough damage as it is, but it's what comes afterwards that is truly terrifying, as he instantly takes off into the sky where he's untouchable and holds up his spear engulfing the entire battlefield in darkness, as the shadows swell until the screen goes to black and you are instantly KO'd. So the only way to stop this move is to strike him while he's making his two shadow wing flap attacks and deal enough damage to disrupt him before he's able to take to the sky because once he does, it is game over. So the freestyle sections of this battle are crucial. It's also important to note, being that Elodin created the Forge Form mechanic, that its own Forge Form has a signature ability unique to it called Secret Weapon, which doubles the speed at which the user's Forge Force gauge is charged. So in the freestyle sections of a Forge Form battle, any damage you deal is translated into your Forge Force gauge, helping it charge so when you fill it up you can use your finisher move, you can install shields like the ones in raid battles, like the ones bosses use in raid battles, or you can switch out to another Forge Form weapon in your party, and then your Forge Force gauge is emptied until you fill it back up again. But his Forge Force gauge fills twice as fast with every strike. So that means he will be able to use his powerful finisher move in the turn-based styles of the battle that much faster. And considering how fast his gauge charges, he may even be able to use his finisher move more than once in the turn-based sections, which will make it that much easier for him to sweep through your team, even if you do manage to survive the freestyle sections. Unlike in the previous Elite Four battles, in this battle there actually would be mini-bosses, as Champion Odin would summon the spirits of ghost types, Draw Grave and Dreamin, so defeating these mini bosses will help you be able to fill your Forge Force gauge and try to keep up with him as he's quickly filling his own. So it is crucial you have a fierce Forge Form weapon and solid strategy if you plan to defeat him. 
but if you do, you will officially be crowned Champion of the Firen Region. Odin will congratulate you and beg that you do what's right as a Loden for Saul and end this madness before it's too late. Given the fact you're currently being manipulated by your version's divine Pokemon, Loden doesn't feel you're ready to wield it quite yet, but says that the day will come. Your divine Pokemon then lets itself out of its Pokeball laughing, before striking down an already weakened Loden after your fight, thanking you for helping it do so, saying with them out of the way the real takeover can finally begin as it takes Odin's crown and shatters it, revealing a rare runestone within it, different from the normal runestone, saying this artifact, called the Rune of Heart, along with all the other runestones your team has been collecting throughout your journey, have the power to reshape the Firen region. You ask what that means, but the Divine Pokemon says you'll see soon enough, before the screen goes black and you basically black out, waking up at the Aurora Hedge. Now, it is important to note that in this time period, your Pokemon have been healed. I don't know if the Divine Pokemon healed it between now and then, but just be thankful you don't have to make a trip to the Pokemon Center because it is here where the final battle of the game will commence, as your relationship with your childhood best friend turned rival is the heart and soul of the story. And just like the No More battle in Scarlet and Violet, takes place after becoming champion. It is also important to note that since last encountering your rival, they have become the leader of their own team as well, and captured their divine Pokemon, and are wielding it as their Forge Form weapon. And I say capture loosely because just how your legendary is possessing you, their legendary has been possessing and manipulating them. So you're both basically pawns, just like leaders Thor and Loki were all along. It is here where the two divine Pokemon will reveal their plan. They've been collecting all these rune stones and needed the rune of heart from the champion because together beneath the northern lights in the Aurora Hedge, they can unlock a magical force that with their divine power, can reshape the Firen region in their image. Naturally, both you and your rival ask exactly what they mean by that, in which case they will reveal their master plan, and that when they say reshape the Firen region in their image, they want to do the same thing that the divine Pokemon from the Luika region sought to do, and make Pokemon superior to humans again, as they feel that Pokemon are the ones with the real magical powers. So the fact that Pokemon have to serve people and do their dirty work both in and out of battle, or even in the case of this region, are literally wielded by humans as weapons, they want to flip the status quo, enslaving humans as they feel humans have Pokemon, and unlock their true power without actually having to be wielded by a human like you. Which is actually part of the reason why the Divine Pokemon at Loden created the Forge Form phenomenon in a way that required the Divine Pokemon in their ultimate forms to be wielded by a human, as a failsafe to keep them in check so they could never abuse this power as it foresaw them one day trying to do. Of course, both you and your rival are completely uncomfortable with this and say you will never let them get away with this. Deep down, I'm sure you're probably mortified you helped them get this far and didn't listen to all the warnings. But they laugh and say, what are you going to do to stop them? It's too late, essentially, and then try to possess you. However, you do something amazing because, well, you're the hero of the story and you are able to break through your divine Pokemon's mind control this time as your willpower to stop them is just too strong. Your rival, however, isn't able to do the same, so you are forced to battle them as they are being possessed in this high-stakes battle. They will, of course, use their final team, their starter Pokemon, and all the other various Pokemon they've used throughout their journey, now including their own divine Pokemon, wielding it as their powerful Forge Form weapon, or in this case, it's possessing and wielding them. In the freestyle sections of this battle, your rival will utilize the same exact signature attacks that leaders Loki and Thor did in the freestyle sections of their battle. However, they will be slightly powered up, and even have a new move added to their roster. If they are wielding Stormer, who's a record type, their standard attacks will leave quite a mark and be able to do damage through blocks. Whereas wielding Ilruz, who's a piercer type, they'd have both close range and long range standard attacks at their disposal, so they can hurl their spear at you. Now, your rival and Stormer signature attacks, for those of you who picked Pokemon Brain, are electricity based, with their most commonly used attack being them jumping up in Thor fashion and crashing down onto the battlefield like thunder engulfed in electricity, taking off a huge chunk of damage and creating an electrical shockwave you must avoid, even if you manage to evade this initial strike. He also has an attack where he holds his hammer up and calls upon several thunderbolts from the sky in quick succession that you must continuously dodge. For those of you playing Pokemon Brain and battling your rival wielding Ilruz, his signature attacks are more magical based, 
He has one series of attacks, like Stormer's Thunderbolt attacks, where he summons Slithering Serpent like shadows from the ground to attack you in quick succession. These are quite difficult to dodge until you get the hang of it. He also has another signature attack where he creates several orbs of psychic energy that follow you around the battlefield and make it hard to evade his standard attacks, as you're essentially contending with two different attacks at once. This is similar to the honing electrical orbs Pursuing Electrode used in Pokemon Legends Arceus. And since this is the final battle, both of these have their own one-hit KO move in the freestyle battle that you have a limited time to stop or it's game over, as they command the entire field, leaving them both vulnerable long enough for you to stop the attack. So you must attack them at this time, and if you can manage to get enough damage in, they will call off their attacks. Stormers being electric-based and being a powered-up version of his Crashing Thunder Hammer attack, that devastates the entire field, and Ilruz is a powered up version of his Slithering Shadows attack that creates a giant shadowy serpent to devour you. Both end the battle instantly, but have a brief period where they strike a pose indicating it's coming, so you must attack them at this time, and if you can manage to get enough damage in, they will call off their attacks. Now that you're both leaders of your respective teams and have a divine Pokemon, this final battle will also determine who the real champion is. After getting midway through your rival's health, there will be a cutscene where you're able to snap through to them and break the hold the Divine Pokemon has over their mind. It is at this point where you stop listening to the Divine Pokemon and letting them control you and decide to end the battle as friends just for fun, ignoring everything that is at stake and all the previous drama, but instead choose to see the battle through as it has always been your dream to have an epic Pokemon battle like this. Afterwards, you're of course reminded that your friendship comes above all else, and as leaders, decide to dismantle both teams, Brain and Brawn, as you've seen firsthand the damage the Turf War has caused, not only on the region as this threat emerged, but on all the relationships of all these people you've encountered. It hindered your relationship with your mother, with your mentor Isaac, it hindered Ragnar's relationship with their brothers, it hindered Gym Leader's Minnie and Magnus's relationship with their father, and of course it hindered your friendship with your best friend turned rival. Which is once again the heart of the story, and this whole sense of division is a big part of the region's themes, as it comments on how the things we believe in, or want, can divide us even from some of the people we love most. So after showing your teams that the Divine Pokemon were just using all of you, having not only captured, but stopped the Divine Pokemon, you both being leaders and you being champion, you're both able to end things once and for all, as you have nothing but respect from all the grunts, as you both have worked your way up from the bottom to get where you are. So after the smoke finally clears, you're able to really have a heart-to-heart -heart with your best friend and both go your separate ways. Once again, friends, and while it's been a rough adventure, you're both thankful for the adventure you shared and how you pushed each other to be the very best you could be. Anyways, that's it for this video and the story of games Pokemon Brain and Pokemon Brawn. But like I said, fear not, there is another video coming up, an epilogue with plenty of fun surprises. So please make sure to hit that like button if you enjoyed the video. Leave a comment down below to let me know which of these Elite Four members or their teams was your favorite. Also, please don't forget to go support all of the artists that made this video possible and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you are having an amazing day.